Hey, Dave. <laughs> hey, Mark. How you doing, man? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing well today, enjoying every minute of it. This is uh, this is a Sunday afternoon recording, everyone, and uh, we're we're going to take a little looser approach here and hopefully yep. have some fun. So, David, a- a- absolutely, David. Uh, so, why what brings us together on this lovely, hot, hazy, and humid Sunday afternoon? Well, as you know, Mark, we continue to monitor and measure uh, mm-hmm. the state of e-grocery on a month-to-month basis, and uh, we just released the June results. So I think we're here to put some context and perspective around those numbers. Awesome. And just so we're clear, June's results are reported in July. So just – yeah. Okay. Yeah, and just to also be clear, the reason that is is that we you know go into the field and – capture, you know, how people were shopping during the month of June at the end of June. So understandably, um, while, you know, some people want real time, uh, we we focus on, you know, uh, valuable insights that takes a little time. Right. And then again, we want to add some perspective to that. So our subscribers, uh, friends and family have seen the report. We've had some one on one conversations with folks. Now, this is a chance to kind of do a little bit of a reveal for the broader audience. So let's so let's take a uh, Step back. I've seen yes. the headline. We've already released this. Why don't you give us just that 30,000 foot level view as to what June's numbers reveal? Obviously, the headline is June numbers are down uh, yeah. versus a year ago and sequentially versus the prior month. I'm not going to dwell on the, the actual absolute declines, um, but I think to 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 quell any fear that may be out there. I mean, this is not the sky is falling, right? Um, We expected ups and downs. We've been talking about that this year, right? This is the year of choppiness and the year of reconciliation. So, you know, the bigger picture is we're we're still running at a rate that's extremely elevated versus pre-COVID. We're seeing a lot of signals that are showing stickiness going forward. And, you know, the growth expectation going forward is likely going to revert to a, tr- uh, a trend that's more similar to the long-term run before uh, the pandemic started. So those are some of the kind of contextual points of view added onto that. And if you hear anything in the bark uh, background, it may be a dog barking. We probably have a ship to home package no. being dropped off right now. Uh, no, actually, that's I think a sound effects. <laughs> it, could, it could be our we audience. Should. We do uh, we do really uh, uh, over index to the canine industry, so or the canine <laughs> population. <laughs> speaking speaking of ship to home, can you comment on the trend that you've been reporting on? Well, while Jeff Bezos went up into the suborbital. Uh, flight that he took this last week we <laughs> saw that he shipped did. to home at, he, he did his I dr he, evil uh he, yeah he did he did you know yeah. i think he may have taken some of the wind or the the propulsion out of the ship to home because really the bigger picture is you know ship to home is where a lot of the deceleration has happened and there's reasons we can chat about you know why that is mm-hmm. one is simply you know, the perceived value of shopping online for ship to home, you know, something from Chewy.com or Amazon.com and getting it left on your doorstep while still cool and still valuable. It's mm-hmm. not the same as what it was before the pandemic. And we largely have delivery and pickup to thank for that evolution of those expectations. So, you know, the ship to home is what's driving the numbers primarily down. So what that means to our core uh, retail or audience, yep. conventional regional grocers, is that the, the the grocery delivery and pickup businesses are actually quite healthy and they're relatively stable right now. Obviously, there's a little more once you get into that relative to where they should be focused and what they should be doing. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, we've, we've talked about this. The trade press in particular focus on the top line message, which is numbers are down. Do you find that the nuance to this is not really getting out there or really discussed very much? I think for a variety of reasons and not to lay blame at any one uh, group's feet, mm-hmm. you know, this is, let's use a triadic alliteration, right? It, it, this is complex. It's confusing 
and it's it, it's really very complicated. You know, it's it's complex because you know, first of all, what's shipped to home versus delivery? We can define that. There's that confusion that goes right. with that. Uh, it, it's also changing, and we're continuing to see these moves, but that's based on customer preferences. So. You know, the media picks up what uh, the the narrative is or that they want to project. We have a lot of companies that are either public or going to go public that are really um, propagating a, uh, a narrative that is focused on delivery. And without question, you know, I understand that the U.S. was a delivery first market, but today it's a del- uh, pickup dominant and I think that gets lost because there's really no one dropping press releases out there saying, you know, let's focus on pickup and here's why. Investors, hedge funds, VC money, yep. they're not investing in pickup, they're investing in delivery. So we get this this uh, this focus on the things that other companies are doing. So it's perpetuating somewhat of a, a distractive narrative to, again, regional and conventional grocers. And we know that because there are questions with regional grocers relative to you know, pickups, uh, ascension and dominance. Right. Um, and I think that's somewhat, uh, an artifact of what they read both in the trade and in the consumer media. Yeah. And, and I, I you know, admittedly it, it's an uphill battle to try and convince some, some retailers that uh, they should not be putting all their eggs in that delivery basket. Well, yeah. I mean, the you know, first thing is, Hey, if you're in delivery, great. You're, you're making your, migration to be a competitive, relevant player online. But the fact of the matter is um, you're still missing or not serving um, more than half of your respective market, likely, based on what we know uh, uh, about households and how they're going online and what their preferences are relative to receiving grocery orders that they place online, regardless of whether it's shipped to home delivery or pickup. So, you know, part of the challenge is, you know, what can't be measured can't be managed or maybe said another way, what's not monitored, right? So some companies that are only in delivery, if they're not getting any kind of visibility into trends below the top line, it's understandable that they um, may perpetuate that that, that narrative simply because they just don't know. And that's the danger that some of the grocery yep. retailers have is that they're not monitoring it the way we're looking at it. And therefore, it's understandable that their point of view is somewhat uh, uh, filtered by whatever lens that they've put over it. Yeah. And, and I mean, that, that gets to another point. You've been tracking this fairly regularly. Can you comment on the degree of channel migration between delivery, pickup, ship to yeah. home? Let's go pre-pandemic. So we yep. continue to use August 2019 as our proxy for pre-pandemic, and that's because we weren't watching this every month. Be, uh, and that was due to the fact that back then, it was sufficient to look at the state of e-grocery on a less frequent basis. And we were looking at it once a year, mm-hmm. and we were seeing it grow at a very slow but steady rate. But at that time, coming into the pandemic, Ship to home was the, you know, the dominant method in terms of, you know, share of order, share of sales, percentage of households that were buying online were using that form. Fast forward to today, let's forget the fluctuations on a month over month basis. Pickup is now used by more of the monthly active user base than any of the other two. And it took the lead in January of this year and it hasn't looked back. Um, it hasn't even been close. Yep. We've seen the share shift to pick up as well. And we now see um, across the country, regardless of the type of market we're looking at, highly mm-hmm. populated to the most rural, pickup is the dominant method across the four market types that we define and analyze each month. So there, there's a litany of things out there that are kind of sprinkling data dots out there that you know retailers just need to connect so that they do see the bigger picture and what that is is um, consumer preferences are very clearly moving toward pickup and we Mm -hmm. would argue and forecast that it's going to continue to move this way for again a range of reasons you can ask me about if you'd like and as a result if you're not in pickup um, you're not going to be in the number one spot right Um, simply because that's where the markets are moving and, and the demographic as well. 
Yeah. The most valuable the, demographic is, is, is yeah, predominantly. Our Goldilocks, our yeah. Goldilocks zone, you know, yeah. the 30 to 60 roughly. Uh, those folks are moving in to pick up in, in ways that, you know, only underscore this going forward. And again, as more and more retailers get into pickup, it's going to attract even the lower income that are more dependent on the EBT SNAP payments because of the structure of those federal programs and what they pay for, and more importantly, what they don't pay. So what, what are the top three reasons for this long-term shift to pick up dominant market? One, it's cost. And this is the explicit cost of that the consumer, when using assist, uh, a service, can make a determination about. So this is the pickup fee versus, let's say, the delivery fee, right? If we look at mass, generally pickup is free yeah. for pick, uh, uh, for that pickup service, whereas they charge seven to nine ninety five for delivery. In the conventional regional grocers, we tend to have pickup at half of that. Some who are more price driven may have uh, reduced their fees even further based on some hurdles. So you have the cost piece. The second right. is control. And control, we can define based on the level of certainty that they have in terms of when they're going to receive the order, right? So in pickup, that control is defined by essentially the wait time. Once I pull into the parking lot, uh, it's the amount of time I wait that determines the level of control or certainty I have. Mm -hmm. Our goal is to reduce the uncertainty because it's the uncertainty that becomes a, a, a driver for dissatisfaction. If you cost someone to wait five minutes or more, maybe even three minutes or more, um, you may be triggering them to become a little frustrated simply because now they have experiences in mass retail with people like Target, notably, right. where the experience that they're having there is far different, meaning they don't wait as long. So, And they're being conditioned to recognize so, it is so easy that they can send their, their kid, I mean, a, so, a, a a legal age driving kid that is to do the pickup. <laughs> um, so if you, if, if Target or, or Walmart is getting that pickup order from staging to uh, to trunk in in two minutes, and you're struggling to get it done in fifteen, there's, there's <laughs> where do you think the consumer is going to go? Well, well, first of all, I'm not even sure the consumer would still be at the pickup point yeah. at 15. You yeah. know, they probably would have peeled out, done some donuts in the parking lot and maybe hit a couple <laughs> of grocery carts on the way. You know, um, because we've always said, you know, listen to Pink Floyd's uh, Comfortably Numb, which runs about five to seven minutes, depending on which track you're listening to. Great song. But boy, oh boy, if you sat cue, in a meeting cue, and cue asked, the track. And just the track. Ask, yeah, just ask the people to sit there and listen and be quiet for that long. Um they would say, OK, we get the point. Let's move on. This is silly. Well, and then let's take a bus to our, our respective pickup points and let's hold our meeting just as as a customer would. And then you'd start to realize, oh, OK, that wasn't so silly because, you know, most of the people using the pickup, they have a young child in the back seat, yeah. and they're cranking on, on the headrest. Maybe they're screaming, throwing things, hopefully soft things. And whoever's driving mom or dad or the nanny. <clears throat> I mean, they're 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 counting the seconds, right? So minutes are like infinite to them. Yeah. yeah. So you know, you I, just have to really have empathy for the customer, and, and the best way to do that is to kind of sit in their uh, their seat, so to speak, because that's what we're talking about with pickup. <clears throat> and this and this gets to the third point. I think you're going to hit on. You talked about cost control. The third yeah. one being. Yeah. So this gets to the expectation. Right. So yeah. part of what we say is the expectation when I drive up to your, you know, Mark's market is being influenced by my past experience at a Walmart or, or a Target. So if Target's knocking it out of the park with sub two minutes and in, in my experience, Bill, from the customer standpoint, I'm sitting 30 seconds, 45, 60 seconds uh, from my standpoint. And I then drive over to Mark's market and I could, you know, knit a sweater in the time it takes for you to bring it out to me. I'm going to be wondering what's Mark's market's priority and motivation. You know, do they really care about me? Because if they did, um, they wouldn't make me sit in the car, especially in this hot weather. And hopefully I'm not 
living and doing pickup in the heat domes, uh, you know, of the West. Right. So, you know, people are going to react very viscerally to that based on these references that they have um, kind of created in their own mind based on experiences somewhere else. So the point we would tell retailers is, look, you <laughs> you really don't control uh, the expectation that the customers have as much as you think. And more importantly, you need to realize that now one third of your customers that are shopping online with you are likely doing the same with Target and Walmart. So whatever Walmart and Target are doing are indirectly affecting or shaping expectations when someone shops with you. And that just becomes kind of part of the point of saying, why do we need to do some of these other things that may be considered cost, you know, cost of doing business? So cost, control, connection three C's going back to what we have already talked about the, the, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, the increasing competition coming from the mass merchants. So do I have this right? At the beginning of COVID, it was about 15% cross yeah. shop. And now it's, it's double that. I mean, technically it's like 28 something and change. I don't have it in front of me, but yeah, yeah. let's just make it easy. It's doubled. Right. And you know, now the digital shopping ecosystem is, mm-hmm. is starting to, evolve like the fiscal. We all know that most households shop, you know, three to five different uh, formats or banners when it comes to satisfying their range of grocery needs, right? And again, grocery as we define it isn't just food and beverage, it's the non-food as well, it's the age restricted. And so now online, we're starting to see that evolve in in a different way, but yet in a similar way as well, right? Um, And so this is one of the challenges that the conventional regional grocers have relative to competing against the discounters, especially with the center store, because those are all UPC driven packaged goods. They're almost universally available anywhere. So it's, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's not an exclusive product. So this is why private labels becoming more important. This is why really differentiating based on the service departments becomes important because frankly, the mass retailers don't have service departments. They do have fresh departments, but everything's packaged up nicely for you. So you know, the other reason conventional regional grocers should be thinking about pickup is, to your point, that connection. You're going to be more able to maintain a an emotional connection as opposed to simply a functional connection, right? Functional connection is I'm able to complete this transaction uh, efficiently in a way that's acceptable, but it doesn't create any emotional response. I mean, you can talk to people who are shopping with Target, especially with drive up. And you'll hear things like, I really love the experience. It's so great that I can now send my kid to do it. Right. And, you know, that that's the type of connection that we as regional grocers need to aspire to maintain. And on top of it, the other reason the pickup obviously is 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 growing is that, hey, it's it's also more convenient uh, because it's on my time. Right. And if I do forget something, I'm just going to go in the store. So the crossover back into the store is another um, diamond in the rough that's kind of latent value potential. And we're already seeing some retailers who are using um, in-store offers online, especially when you're doing pickup and, and yep. drive up, to elicit that that kind of like unplanned in-store visit, which is intended to obviously drive even more incremental sales and value for the customer and the retailer. So, Awesome. David, um, I'm going to ask one more question. Um, Yeah. I saw a story uh, last week or so for back to school. What what are you projecting going forward? Because I believe there's another federal stimulus that's expected and child tax benefit. It it actually is on its way if it hasn't already been received. Starting in July, households with children, I think it's 18 and under, um, can be eligible for a payment between $250 and $300. The the $300 tends to qualify for families who have children under, I believe it's six. So, you know, if you have three kids under 18, and let's say they're all over six, that's $750 additional each month through the end of the year. So that's six more months, right? We do have um, some tapering that's going to come in September relative to the unemployment insurance. But again, you know, um, we just don't know what else is coming down the pike. Some of these things can develop relatively rapidly, rapidly relative to, you know, 
how most legislation moves forward in D.C. So, you know, we again are continue to have to manage through a time where we have these much needed subsidies, right, in the form of uh, federal impact payments. At the same time, it does muddy the waters in terms of, you know, where do we kind of find uh, really this equilibrium where we truly have people who are, are going to shop this way going forward. Right. So, you know, with that being said, obviously, many of these households are in much need of this. The economy is in much need of that. I know there's a lot of talk about inflation, but, you know, again, inflation put in perspective is nowhere near it was in the 70s. So, you know, I think the Fed is looking at this from a longer term, but near term, people need to put food on the plate. So I think that's a good thing. And if it helps propel uh, and put tailwinds into e-commerce, I'm sure most retailers would be okay with that. Well, we know one thing for sure. Going forward, your insights are going to be just as compelling some, uh, content to consume as they have been uh, throughout the pandemic. Yeah, and I would just uh, you know suggest to retailers who don't quite understand uh, some of the points that you and I are talking about to you know, request a copy of this report yes, from Mercatus or BMC and schedule a time to sit down and chat about this. Because, you know, one of the things that we focus on, as you know, Mark, is interrogating the insights. And that's predicated on knowing which questions to ask and then really probing and understanding these issues, first and foremost, from the customer perspective before translating into what it means. And so I would just encourage retailers who are maybe seeing something different to reach out, engage us in some meaningful dialogue, and let's see where it goes. Because ultimately, it's only going to benefit them by having a a better view of this this marketplace. And if they do, they will understand what we're then talking about, and they'll see the need to, you know, to, to invest in these areas and to invest in some of these solutions that we're talking about. Another great overview of, uh, of, these uh, e-grocery insights. David, I appreciate it. Thanks for your time. How can people get a hold of you? Well, they could always uh, find me and connect via LinkedIn, or they can shoot me an email at david.bishop at brickmeetsclick.com. Awesome. And if you're interested in having a dialogue with Mercatus, feel free to reach out to us at www.mercatus.com. Thanks, David. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, Mark. You too. Be sure to check out more of David's insights at brickmeetsclick.com. And for the latest from Mercatus, check out mercatus.com. Links to all of this, as well as some additional suggested content, are in the description below. Be sure to connect with Mercatus on social at Mercatus Tech on Twitter and on Instagram and at Mercatus Technologies on Facebook and, of course, on LinkedIn. Please like, subscribe, and click that bell icon so you never miss a video. And thanks for watching.